morning. How are you doing? Nice to see you all. Uh, such an awesome pleasure that you could make time to, to come. We learn together. I see Sydney is already on. Welcome, Sydney. And uh, okay. so <laughs> we will not take uh, much time. As is, as is our practice, uh, we will start the session with Sydney. She will do her presentation, just a bit of a background. Um, okay, first of all, my name is Aurelia Monene. I coordinate the Journal Club. Number two, uh, this is a part two of a session we had with Sydney last uh, two weeks ago. Sydney joined us in um, uh, meeting one of the needs that many club members are struggling with, which is writing. And she was able to take up group at one and she was very gracious to review papers of people who needed feedback on their writing. And I think she's reviewed over 17 papers, not an easy feat. And we really, really thank you so much, Sydney, for doing that. So today is part two, a continuation of last time conversation, but also she'll give a bit of uh, feedback from what she has seen from the papers that uh, people have presented. And Sydney is based in Canada. So she's had to also wake up quite early to join us uh, today. And uh, let me be, just give a bit of a background. Her background is gender and program monitoring, monitoring and evaluation specialist. She's a founder of Emergent uh, Collective, a very um, great collective that I'm part of, where we discuss issues of gender and, and the work we do around that. She's a junior fellow um, at the University of Toronto, Massey College. She's been a facilitator of gender responsive policy development workshop um, on global affairs Canada's uh, funded project. Mm -hmm. She's also pursuing a doctorate in education at Ontario Institute for Studies in, edu uh, in Education at University of mm -hmm. Toronto. So we are pleasured. Uh, we have a lot of pressure to have you today. Uh, Sydney, over to you. Take it from there. Aurelia, thank you so much. Good morning. Is it still morning for everyone? I hope 10 in the morning. Yes, it's still morning for everyone else. So that's good. Um, I first of all, just want to say I'm, I'm so impressed by all of the different topics that everybody's working on, and the work that you're doing. Um, I learned so much, my goodness, I learned something about so many different sectors uh, in reading in reading all of your papers. Um, my goodness, we went from um, corporate social responsibility and how that impacts maternal health. Um, uh, I looked at, uh, I learned a bit of, uh, more about Kenyan ASL. Um, I learned about the effects of business processing outsourcing on economic growth in Kenya and uh, the impact of COVID on the mental health of students studying a particular uh, county in Kenya. So um, your learning is my learning and I'm so happy to have, have been gone through some of your papers and, and to learn a bit about what you're studying and, and the very, very important work that you're all doing. So thank you for sharing uh, those papers with me. Um, I just wanted to, before we, before we get into the, the actual, um, the uh, presentation today, I just wanted to ask you how many of you, and I don't know how we can do this, maybe you could just say uh, in the chat, if you are hoping to take your paper, if it's just purely for um, the, the necessities of your own academic program, or are you looking to publish your papers? So uh, maybe if you could just drop, you know, publish or, or degree or what what is some of the reasons that you, you've written your papers um, that that we're looking at today, and then uh, I'll take that into consideration as well as we as we go through the presentation. Um, uh, okay, so good. So there's some. I just wondered uh, how many of these papers were were just part of your academic process towards your degrees, or in, in your programs, or how many? And sometimes th those two things can be true. So you're publishing as part of your program. Great. Okay. Um, and I noticed that some of you are master's students, some of you are PhD students, exactly. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen. And now, um, I'm gonna make the chat small. Uh, 
I'm not sure. Are, are you all able to see um, my my slides? Yes, we can yeah. see. Yeah. You know, we had this game before where I wasn't sure. So now, <laughs> yeah. now I can. I'm going to make the screen the screen okay. big again. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so um, last time we really went into. Um, the idea around, you know, the research paper, what you're trying to do in it, uh, what are you trying to accomplish when you're writing your papers. Um, and this week, having looked at the papers themselves and, and um, determining some of the things, some of the recurring issues and some of the challenges that you're having, I thought I would address those collectively um, and, and give you all some feedback, uh, some of it which was the same for, for lots of you. Um, and so I started to think about how we could talk about this. And for some of you, this will be a bit um, of a back step. Some of you are a little bit farther ahead in the process of, of, of structuring an academic paper. Um, but I just did want to go back and review for others who are not quite so, so far ahead um, or just need some additional review about that. So um, the idea or the concept that came to me was about building a strong house, building your theoretical house in your paper or in your essay. And so I chose the background of actually, you know, construction. You can see the floorboards there in the bottom of my presentation. So I thought this was a very good um, uh, design to use for today's discussion. Um, so sorry, I'm just also gonna do this so I can see my own slides. Uh, what do you need to build a house? Well, obviously you need the materials. Um, you need all the building materials, the, the concrete, the, the, the wood or the bricks, uh, the, the glass for the windows. But I just wanted to address really the three um, most important parts of the house. And uh, number one, of course, being over here on the right-hand corner, which is the foundation of the house. Um, number two being the walls, the structure of the house, and number three being the roof of the house. Uh, without any of these one, two, threes, you're not going to get a very good, good night's sleep because either your house is going to be shaken around or your, the wind is going to be blowing through or the rain will come on top of you if you don't have a sound, sound house that you're building with your paper. Um, Last time we talked about, you know, the structure of a, of a house looking a bit like an hourglass, like a, t a time, uh, and I actually have my hourglass with me this time, Lo looking like an hourglass where you've got a lot of information at the top, you focus and narrow it in, um, in the center and then broadening it back out again. But you can overlay that sort of concept onto this, onto this uh, image of the house. Um, okay. So the purpose of a foundation, uh, what is it? What do you need it for? It does two things. Um, it, uh, it's the lowest load bearing part of a building. And um, if you're talking about construction, that's the process of, that's why you need a foundation. If you're talking about writing a paper, it's your underlying basis or the principle for your paper. Um, and it's doing the same, it's doing the same work. It's gonna hold up the rest of your argument. So uh, let's look at those two concepts again. Um, so load bearing in terms of the construction, it has to hold up your house. So how you lay the foundation at the beginning is going to be the strength of it, the rest of it moving up. Um, now, if you've ever, I don't know how many of you have built a house or, or tried to build something, construct something from the bottom up, um, but the, sometimes the problem is if you, if you make a bigger claim on the bottom than the rest of your house can support, then you get into a bit of trouble. So not only does your foundation have to be strong, but then the rest of it has to, has to come up at the same time. And if you don't have the materials to build the rest of your house, your foundation isn't going to help you all that much. And um, the soundness of that foundation also depends on, on the authority on which it rests. So the ground, the groundwork. And we talked a little bit about that last time. I think I talked about it in terms of stepping into this academic river. So I'm, I shouldn't mix too many metaphors here, but um, just making sure it has a solid grounding. And we talked about that last time in terms of how it refers to past work, uh, prior intellectual work that's been done, theoretical work, um, and, and how you're situating your own work in that, in that environment, in that landscape that already exists. Um, and then, 
so then, okay, so then moving back into the theoretical part or the, the thesis writing part, um, it's that sound argument around which everything else is constructed. So you sometimes you don't even see the foundation um, of a house, but what happens all on top of it is, is, is built on what comes before. Uh, it will also determine the shape of your arguments. So you know that if you look at a blueprint, if you look at that, that foundational basis, it's gonna determine what goes up on top of it. Um, and then also, <laughs> this is a hard question to keep asking yourself because sometimes it can make you feel a little bit bad, <laughs> but with every step, every progression in your paper, you need to keep asking yourself, so what? Every sentence you write, you need to be able to answer that question, so what? Why did I just write that sentence? What piece, what place, what point is it making um, for my argument? Are there any questions up, up to now, just talking about the foundation of your, of your papers and what that means? I think that's, that's, the, that's the base part. It should be um, pretty, pretty, pretty rudimentary, as they say, in terms of, a fa in terms of what, what I'm explaining there. And again, lots of you are, are kind of there here, well past it. Um, so I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep moving then. Um, okay, so key questions to ask yourself uh, from the get-go. Um, why this thesis or problem? Why am I studying this? Why, what am I looking at? Why now? So when you're developing your thesis question and you're trying to go from the ground up and sort of formulate how the structure of your paper is gonna work out, um, you're asking these questions to yourself. Why this thesis problem? Why now? Why here? And when I say why here, um, so you may, you, you, you've come up with a general idea, but all of you, uh, or the majority of you are speaking about um, those, that, that uh, theory in terms of a space and a place and a people. Um, why here? Uh, I think, you know, um, in many of the papers I saw, you're not just going from national, a national level of discussion, um, but in many cases, you're going to a county discussion or you're going to a town discussion. So the here and the why is actually really important. And why is this relevant? Again, how does it relate to other things that have been said already in that academic environment in which you're now in presenting your own work? Um, so constantly asking yourselves these questions. Uh, why, why now, why here, why is it relevant now? Why is it coming up now? And if I look at some of the topics of your papers, you can see why COVID, what's the impact of COVID on the mental health of students? Mm, that's a really good question for now. Um, uh, there may have been a new policy. I, I read an interesting paper about um, wind rates and the effect, um, the effect that has on buildings and how you measure um, the effectiveness of the building structure based on wind rates that, uh, believe me, I am not a physicist, I am not a mathematician, so for me it was really interesting to read, read that, that paper, um, but that could have been a, come about because there's a new policy, a new construction policy, and they're looking to review and revamp that policy, and now is a good time to look at why they should do that. Um, and then you want to think about uh, how is that what I'm saying it's either going to affirm what's been already said before, or it's going to refute what's been said before. So you're either affirming or refuting, or just sometimes saying, you know, this topic has been taken to here in the past, and I'm going to take it that step further. So building on what already exists. Um, and then another question you can ask yourself, and this is really an important question, who needs to know what I know and why? And as long as you are asking yourself that question through the entire time that you're writing, your writing should be more clear and your writing should be, mm, I think clarity is probably the, the, best, uh, the best outcome there. Why, why do you think that might be true? If you're asking yourself the question, who needs to know what I know and why, if you can answer that at, at almost every sentence in your, in your paper, um, why is that so important in terms of how you're writing it? Uh, we can go to the chat if you, whoops. Uh, let me see if I can, if I'm sharing, can I see the chat? Yeah, I can. 
so if I'm going to ask myself that question again. So how does my study or my, my um, who needs to know and why, um, how is that going to help you formulate and, and structure even your sentences in your paper? Anybody have an idea? Well, everybody, I'm hoping a lot of you have said you're going to publish. So what I do know about that, um, let me see. Um, so to Jackie, uh, where are you hoping to publish? In a, are you hoping to publish in a, in a journal or a newspaper or an academic uh, journal? I'm going to ask, where are some of the people hoping to publish? Jackie or Nicholas, you can just drop it in the chat. Maybe a, a academic journal. Okay. All right. Yeah, like for instance, the for communication, the journalism and mass communication quarterly. Great. So journalism and mass communication quarterly. Um, who's going to be reading that journal? Uh, we look at uh, professionals in the media in the media industry, like uh, students doing uh, journalism and mass communication at graduate level. We do people dealing with corporate studies in terms of uh, crisis and communication uh, management and uh, the impact it has on its audience. Great. So I was really glad to hear that it's not just journalists who are reading that paper. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a it's a whole host of people that are going to be reading that journal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm 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 really happy for you to provide your feedback. This is this is how um, we're going to be able to talk to each other in the chat or just. Um, uh if you're you can even unmute and just join in um okay yeah uh usually you're writing to an audience and if you're writing to a specific journal um then you're going to need to direct the direct uh in in some in many ways your language and your use of language to the um your perceived audience who's going to read that journal um and I, I just want to say that is true, but uh, now whether or not I know or whether or not I'm a specialist in any one of those regions or areas that you're studying, I should be able to get through your paper. We, it's, it's possible that we may not be able to understand the, uh, the granular details of it, but um, it should be clear enough and structured well enough that somebody can follow your argument. Um, without necessarily completely understanding, because again, boy, that wind speed paper, uh, I was out to lunch on a lot of the formulas that were being used mathematically, um, but, but following the gist of it, uh, I was able to do that. So, okay, so you're writing to a particular audience, I guess is, is my point there, and that your writing should have clarity. And uh, now I'm gonna get into how do you achieve that level of clarity? Um, okay. So I'm going to exit the chat there. All right. Um, so, oh, wait a minute. I just want to make sure. Yep, we've gone to the foundation and what we're doing with the foundation. Now the walls. The walls I'm going to talk about in terms of bricks and mortar. And I know this is going to sound rudimentary to many of you, um, but it's not, it's not so simple sometimes. Um, obviously, that foundational introductory sentence of, of your thesis paper um, and actually every paragraph um, what is this paragraph about? And that, or what is this thesis paper about? Um, one of the comments that I made repeatedly um, was, uh, you know, often I get two, three pages in, and I don't yet know what your thesis is about. And I understand that in, when you're writing that introduction, uh, when you're giving the background information on your thesis, um, you're still going to want to do that by announcing what your thesis is about right up front. So if I'm now three, four, five pages in and I don't know what your thesis is or your problem statement is, we have a problem. So you need to go back up there and, and make sure you're stating it clearly right from the right from the get-go. Um, so make your claim. Make your claim. Uh, and this is what really the whole paper is. This is it right there. You make your claim. You show your evidence for that claim. You provide some analysis for your claim and you close and connect. 
if I'm thinking about a house and, and the bricks with which you build your house, you could look at that, this slide as either the structure for the entire paper or the structure for each paragraph. Um, you know, so your paragraph begins with a claim, you're showing your evidence in the middle of it, providing a bit of analysis, and you're closing and connecting. Um, and when I say connecting, that's where the mortar pieces comes in. And this was one aspect of a lot of the papers that I found could use a little bit more work. So you all are very good at making a claim. Uh, we all love to make a claim. I, I, everybody loves to make a claim. Um, and in some cases, showing the evidence. A little bit more work around the analysis, I, I think uh, could be done sometimes, but the close and connect piece is really important. So when I say close and connect, at the end of a paragraph, what you want to do is kind of draw your draw your reader. You said, I've said this, I've said that, and now here's my next idea. Now, the connection can either happen in the last sentence of your paragraph or in the first sentence of the following paragraph. But those connecting pieces, which I often call bridge pieces, if you, if you I think I often call them bridge pieces, are going to be what makes your article flow are going to be what holds it together. And literally, it's the mortar between the bricks. And it's just as important as the bricks themselves. Because if you just have a bunch of individual bricks, um, you, you get into a bit of trouble. They don't flow. And this is what happens. You just get a pile of bricks. Um, and that, that doesn't make for a good house. It makes for a jumble of, of statements or claims that are disjointed. Uh, or you know maybe in and of themselves have substance but they're not put together in such a way that the argument is built strongly. So um, some of the reasons for those, that jumble of bricks or the, the whole tumble thing um, can be, um, you have disjointed paragraphs with no connecting mortar. In other words, you closed, but you didn't connect. Um, uh, the argument does not build on itself. So in other words, almost every paragraph, you're making a separate claim statement. So you go, you're moving from one thing to the next, but it's not clear to the reader how they're connected to the paragraphs that come before. And when you do that, um, you can bombard someone with a lot of information, but it's not connected and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, sometimes it's because the bricks in your argument, I, I hope you don't get tired already of the construction metaphor, but I'm gonna be off it in a minute. Um, they're not evenly distributed. So for example, um, this was one of the issues that I saw in, in one paper in particular, really front end loaded, very heavy on the history, the theoretical background, which is really good. Um, but then, uh, and so lots and lots and lots of time spent there, and then a lot less on moving that their new claim forward. So this is what's happened. This is the reason here are all of the all of the people who have already worked in this area, but then not quite enough moving forward about what that individual is saying themselves and building their own argument. Um, so when the bricks are unevenly distributed, they're not they're not helping the structure of the paper. Um, if your whole paper is just a whole data dump, and you're not giving the reader any contents for what that data means or you're not synthesizing it for your reader, or you're not analyzing it, you just dumped it in there, um, you're, you're not making your argument um, as, as well as you could. Whoops, um, I just wanna also make sure that I'm not missing something in the chat. If, um... Oh, okay. Um, oh, I'm glad, Nicholas, I'm glad this is insightful because I, I feel like you know so many of your, you, you know, you're all writing at such a high level and yet, you can forget these very rudimentary sort of um, sort of practices that go into writing that just makes your paper more readable. And when it's more readable, it's more authoritative. When people get thrown off because it's a pile of bricks, they get thrown off your argument and, and people are not as convinced. So believe me, um, you can be the smartest person in the world and have all the great and the best data. And if you dump it in there without context and helping people along, um, your paper is gonna be not as strong. And, and you all have, you're all working on such important things that your paper should be as strong as possible. Um, so I'm gonna click out the chat there again and keep going. So, okay, again, let's look at that mortar. So we're looking at the bricks. Everybody focuses on the bricks because that's where the information is, right? Here's the data, here's the information. And yet, 
um, it's that mortar that really for me <laughs> uh, is is just as important as as the as the as the data and the, and um, and everything else is going to the paper. So let's look at that mortar. It contextualizes your argument um, regionally, historically, theoretically, rhetorically, or within a specific community or subpopulation. So um, you know your your paper um so again you can you can get the sense right i'm making a claim well let's ask those why questions again why is it that claim important here why is that claim important now why is that claim important in the context of work that's already happened um rhetorically what is the thing that i'm actually trying to say and who am i trying to say it about um, and so, you know, when you're connecting all of these different things together, it's really important, really important that you focus not just on those individual bricks, but how they all go together, because look what you're trying to do. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work that your house is trying to do for you. Um, and so I just wrote, I just added these little stepping stones, but let's keep it to bricks, because again, I don't want to use too many metaphors here. The flow between your paragraphs that closing and opening, that closing and connecting and the bridging that you create between your paragraphs is really important and it cements your thesis argument. Again, it's hard to read a jumble of bricks, but everybody loves to see a nice clean wall, you know? Um, okay, I'm gonna keep moving. Anybody have any questions to now? There's a hand from James. James Leto, your hand is up. Yep, James. Should I look in the chat or? Uh, he's sorry, 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 sorry about that. No problem. Hi, James. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Hi, hi, how are you? A nice presentation. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> how, what? No, yeah. no, it is, it is, it is. T tell me your question. Well, I, I think I, 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 I put up my hand. Uh, I, I was not intending to do so, ah, but okay. maybe just maybe now that I, I have the opportunity mm -hmm. in terms of uh, because I'm also uh, completing my my MSc in clinical psychology. OK, I wanted to find out uh, in terms of publishing. <clears throat> uh any any and i hope i'm not getting out of the context of your uh, nice presentation uh internationally in terms of publishing how can one go about that maybe that is a question you can address at the end of it so that i don't get out of uh whatever uh, i mean the, the the flow of what you've been talking about okay um, you know what, James, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've just written a note to myself to come back to that. Uh, sure, and I sure. think, Thank you. Yeah, but I think that's actually a really good question. And I'm, I'm happy that you asked it. Um, I'm, I hope I can provide some insight um, on that uh, at closer to the end. Um, and you know, if you have any other questions, drop them in the chat. And then when we're done, we can go back and look at some of those uh, one by one. So actually, you know, if you just want to put it in the chat, I have the note, but let's put it in the chat so it's there uh, when we come to the end. And anybody else moving through this, if you if you have a question or something's not clear or you want to know about something else, um, drop it in the chat and then we'll go uh, in the end and look through those questions. OK, excellent. Um, now, this should be uh, this should be an important or this should this should be interesting um, to many of you who are hoping to publish now. Um, uh, I just want to make sure I didn't get ahead of myself here because did I? Yes, I did. There we go. I knew it. I was missing a slide. Citation and acknowledgement. Um, this is really uh, this is really important. Um, I'm backing up again because I I did get way ahead of myself. Citations, 
quotes, references, and acknowledgements. These are not all quite the same, um, but they all get at the same idea. And that idea is how are you acknowledging the work that's been done before? How are you representing that work? And making sure that your, your claim is separate from, from that work and that your work is separate from the work that's come before, but that you're acknowledging it and that you're referring and referencing and citing it. Um, and I just want to read out to you the academic policy at the University of Toronto um, for when you're when you're writing papers, um, what you need to bear in mind before you get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, you can read it yourselves, but it is an offense for a student knowingly to represent as one's own, uh, as one's own, any idea or expression of an idea or work of another in academic examination or term test or in connection with any other form of academic work to commit plagiarism. So now, Plagiarism is a very strong word. Um, and obviously in academic circles, it's like the biggest no-no, right? It's the thing that we're all trying to avoid. And it's the thing that's so hard to avoid at the same time, because you know, you, you're know, when you're contextualizing your theoretical background, you're citing people, you're referring to, to you know, theoreticians or people who have been working in your field already. Um, and it's very tricky it's a very tricky thing to present uh, and, and, and put your ideas forth uh, and cite those other ideas without um, stepping on toes or without um, kind of representing somebody else's work as your own. Uh, and it's really important to make these distinctions, especially if you're looking to publish, um, especially if these are peer reviewed papers, um, because um, uh, so two, for two reasons, obviously because you know, using someone else's work or, or incorporating someone else's ideas or, uh, or even a term um, into your paper without citing or acknowledging it um, is not only unfair, um, if you're looking to a publish in an academic or sorry, in a peer reviewed paper, um, they might catch you out on it and, and, and you'll, you, a, you won't be published and you, and you may be called out on it. Um, and so making the distinction between what's yours and what's theirs is really, really important. Um, um, and it's it can be tricky, um, and sometimes students make the mistake of of a sort of presenting knowledge um, that is not theirs in a way that they th that they don't mean to necessarily plagiarize, but it just comes it it happens that way. So, how do you do it? Um, and this was this was something that recurred in some of the papers too. So what I'm going to say to you is that. And you'll see this at the bottom. Um, when you are taking a uh, text or a quotation, or you're citing um, a, a sort of a sentence or even a paragraph, but largely a sentence or a couple of sentences from any other academic, um, it's best that you can kind of integrate your knowledge or your acknowledgments into what you're saying. There are different ways of doing that. Um, but, you know, just sort of taking quote after quote after quote after quote from somebody else's work and building up a paragraph with those quotes um, is not, it, it, it's, um, that's not the way to build your argument. And also it's not the most ethical way to build your argument because really you're just borrowing from someone else and plonking it in as though it looks like your own. Um, so you have to integrate your acknowledgements into what you're saying. So there's, again, there's lots of ways of doing that. You can say X says, or Y argues that, and then you plunk it in, um, and then you and and then you have to say what you have to say about it. So, if I'm looking at um, a bunch of paragraphs that say um, X says this or Y argues that X says this and then Y argues that, yes, that's 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 actually a legitimate way of doing it. <clears throat> Sorry, but without then also integrating your own ideas and your own thoughts about those that work. Um, then you're just they're just pawning on a bunch of quotations that don't really get you anywhere in terms of your argument, but also could get you into trouble in terms of it publishing and borrowing um, from other people's work. So when you're use use your own words, use your own words when you're when you're integrating somebody else's knowledge into your paper or quote theirs. So um, if you're gonna if you're gonna take uh, um, two or three sentences from somebody else's work, use those quotation marks. Make sure that it's understood that that if you've lifted it right out of another um, article and you're dropping it into yours, uh, either 
say, you know, X says this, Y argues that, drop it in. Uh, and you can, you don't necessarily have to use quotation marks, but you have to make it evident that that, that, that is not your own work. Um, and then one of the other ways, so this is something that I saw in, in a number of your papers. I saw it like an entire passage of text um, from another author and you've cited it. And yes, it's good to do that. So you, I, I, here's what it looked like, the whole thing. And then, you know, you're putting the last name of your author and the date of the publication. And yes, you're citing the author, but nowhere in that entire passage do you give an indication where their writing starts and where yours begins. I just have this whole paragraph of somebody else's work and a citation at the end, but you have to acknowledge that it is somebody else's in, in, the, in the construction of that paragraph. Um, because otherwise uh, you, you may get into trouble. Um, and I know that academically speaking at the University of Toronto, they, um, they actually use software and they run your paper through, through um, a software application that if your journal, if, your, if the articles that you're pulling from have been digitized in any way, um, it'll match it up with those journal articles and, and, and they will know and they will be able to see um, uh, exactly what you're quoting, exactly what is yours. And so uh, students can get into a whole bunch of trouble, um, academically speaking, if their instructor feels like they're lifting somebody else's work and dumping it into their own. It's tricky. Citation and acknowledgement is very tricky. Um, but just be honest, as honest and upfront uh, with it as you as you can, because I don't want any of you to get to get into trouble or have your papers rejected because of it. It's really important. Uh, I might. I, I wonder if um, I am going to just ask about uh, questions there. Okay. Um, these are some ways to get around, or these are not get around, but these are the, some ways of doing citations. So uh, you can say writing in 1976. Ramsey Cook asserted that Canada was in a period of critical instability. Now, um, critical instability is probably not a term that I thought of. It's Ramsey Cook's, but I've said there, uh, writing in 1976, he asserted that blah, blah, blah. Um, now, I may have directly lifted that term, critical instability, but I don't need to put quotation marks around it because I'm giving you the page number. And I've also said he said it. Um, so I don't necessarily need the quotation marks. Another way of doing that is saying one writer, then you'd say who the writer was, even argues that the Great Pyramid was built for the purpose of guiding navigation. So you, those words are not yours. The purpose of guiding navigation is probably not yours, but you've included the author there. You've said one writer even argues that. So again, you don't need the quotation marks, but you need to contextualize what you've lifted and what, what you're borrowing or what you're, what you're citing. Well, and one more. Um, as Morris claims in his book, uh, this is my own, <laughs> as Morris claims in his book, Eating While Driving, How to Keep Your Pants Clean, 2002. Um, so you, you can say something, as you can either uh, quote the book, the, the, the source right there with the quotation marks and the year it was published, but again, um, referring to who wrote that book. As Morris claims in his book, and in his book, Eating While Driving, How to Keep Your Pants Clean, um, it's always a good idea, continuing on in that sentence, it's always a good idea to carry um, a napkin with you in your car. I don't know, however we wanna finish that sentence, but um, making sure that you're always citing uh, properly your sources, it's really, really important. And I am going to stop there for a second because I'm wondering if there are any questions uh, in the chat about that or what I've just said. Uh, this may be basic, but how do you grammar check and use? Uh, yeah, turn in, turn it in. That's it. Um, so that's that's some of the that's actually some of the this plat, the software that they use is turn it in. Um, I'm not sure if I I don't have access to turn it in. Um, the university has a license, um, but I don't have one personally. Um, so that's interesting. If you have access to turn it in, turn it in and see see where you're making those mistakes. It'll point out where where your mistakes are being made. Um, but I, I don't think a lot of people would have access to that software. Just making sure that you are citing and acknowledging your authors uh, is really, really important. OK, um, so I'm going to go back and keep going. Then, if you don't have any other questions about that topic, again, it'd be tricky, but it's so important. Um, okay. 
um, you're going to look at this and you're thinking, what, oh, is, this, what is this about? But, um, this slide is about vagary. <laughs> this slide is about when you get academically lazy. And oh, just reminding everyone to mute their uh, mute their, mute their, uh, their microphone, okay? Great. Okay. I put this like a podium at the Olympics. So these are some lazy words to use, not, not necessarily just then in and of themselves. Um, but, you know, some people argue or they argue or some have said or some things do that um, or they, um, you know, obviously if you need the word in the sentence to make it grammatically correct, then it's fine. Um, but these are just really lazy ways of not putting the detail in the paper that you need. And the captain, the gold medal winner, the gold medal word that people use to, is it. People use the word it all the time. It shows, it determines, um, um, what, what are the ways that it comes up? It is, is like the fanciest, laziest word for the catch-all that tries to tell everything with saying, without saying anything. Um, so if you find the word it at the beginning of any of your sentences in your paper, do a word search and I'm not kidding you. This is, it's the gold medal, it's the gold medal word um, that is the most lazy word in all of your paper because you're not giving any detail around anything at all. Um, it will tell us, I, I don't know what it is. Your reader will say, I, I, I don't know, it, that it could be a number of things. So go do a search. I'm, I'm telling you right now, search a paper, find the it's and correct them and give the proper detail um, because it can be confusing or it can just be super lazy and enough of it's in a paper will just throw people off. Um, uh, I know it sounds a bit of a strange thing. Somebody's, does somebody have their hand up? I just heard somebody unmute. No? We have James, but I'm not sure if he's aware. James, are you, is your hand up? But we also have some questions on chat. Yeah, good. Oh, Tom. Tom's giving a lot of extra extraneous advice here that is very good. Um, how about grammar check? Yep, you can do a grammar check, but a grammar check is not going to catch the it's because grammatically it is correct. Um, but uh, rhetorically, it is very not correct um, just because it's just gold medal lazy. Um, but yes, those are really great suggestions. Thank you so much. To go back, do a spell check of your paper and do a grammar check, really important. Um, oh, and I'm glad that we talked of, okay, yeah. No, plagiarizing in, in when you're publishing is really important because again, uh, you could get into a lot of trouble. And, and if you do get into a lot of trouble, um, when you go to try and publish or even when you submit your paper, um, uh, it, can, it can really, taint your your uh your um your reputation as an academic and as a student if not you know you could actually just for one reason if you present a thesis your your master's thesis or your phd thesis and, and a lot of other people's work has been dumped into that without citation reference or acknowledgement um you can either you can pay, you can fail uh which is not not a good feeling um at the university of toronto a number of years ago um uh, a, a student in the history department um, was was defending their thesis, and and unfortunately, their thesis supervisor didn't catch it. But <laughs> but this student, um, without citing the author, gave this whole section of their of their uh, of their argument um, to the room of their adjudicators. And one of their adjudicators said, "Oh, that's in that's a very interesting um, theory that you're raising," and and he said. Um, he said, because it's mine. <laughs> and the student um, didn't really know what to say and they actually failed and they got, they got um, reprimanded uh, for two years. They had to leave the University of Toronto and rewrite that, that, that obviously that section of the thesis, but I think not, not the entire, entire thing and then come back. But they got put on academic probation for two years and it was really embarrassing. And it was also embarrassing for the supervisor who did not catch the fact that that huge piece of theory had been dumped in there, and one of the one of the adjudicators, who was an external adjudicator and examiner, um, was the actual author of that section that they had dumped in there. So the supervisor didn't catch it, but the student took a big risk 
in doing that. And in the end, it didn't work out so well. Um, yeah, great. Um, everybody, you're just really helping each other along by, uh, by providing some of these additional um, uh, comments here in the chat. Um, can you mix different citation methods in the same? Yes, absolutely you can. Um, so, you know, you can do those parenthetical things. Um, uh, you can do quotation marks when you're really taking uh, a section that needs that, you know, you can uh, use that, that tab feature to sort of move in on the quotation and drop it out of the context of your paragraph to highlight it. Um, there's different ways of cite citing things. And I would, I would ask you, um, maybe your, your university has some citation references for you, um, and I would, I would use them. I would use them because uh, it, it's a really, really important to get that part right. Um, how do you cite a bunch of mathematical equations for people in mathematics, statistics, or physics, for example? That's a really good question. And I'm not gonna be your best person to answer that. Um, you don't necessarily have to cite the mathematical equation. Um, you have to say who developed it because you um, often, um, you're right, theories and formulas uh, will be lifted and borrowed from other uh, mathematicians or scientists in the past. But I think as long as you're acknowledging them and if you then provide the, the formula there, people will know um, whose work that is. Um, and yeah, again, it's all about citing and acknowledging. So you, can, you don't necessarily have to put quotation marks around a, theor a theorem or a formula, but just acknowledge who's, whose it is. Um, okay, uh, last time, one of the issues that came up was um, this idea of validity. And when you're doing research, um, trying to determine uh, the validity of your research project and then keeping, keeping the actual study or the validity of the study um, in intact. And I'm gonna just take this chat off here for a sec and we can talk about validity um, because the last time I brought it up, but we didn't really go into it. Um, there are a number of, of uh, threats to the validity of any study or any, any, um, any research that is going to be done. Um, there are internal threats to your validity of your research, and there are external threats to validity. Um, internal threats to validity, there's a number of them, and, and I'm only, there, there's more than that, but I'm, I'm only listing uh, a, a number of them here. And I'm going to go through a couple of them just to talk about the general idea of threats to validity. And then what I would encourage you to do is, is maybe look up um, uh, these, different these different threats to validity and make sure that none of these is going to happen if you're in the process of designing your study. Or if, if, if you've done it already and maybe you've discovered you know what, I think I have one of these problems. So let's let, let's look at them. So internal threats to validity can be um, history, I'm going to go into a bit of these, history, maturation, instrumentation, statistical regression, um, differential selection, experimental mor morality. Um, and these are all um, sort of threats that happen within the study itself. Um, they're not things that are happening outside of the study that are having an impact um, externally. They're actually often part of your design, your, your uh, study design, um, or in the implementation of how you're carrying out your research. Um, external threats to validity can be a lack of explicit description of, of independent variables, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, a, in another slide. Um, multiple treatment interference, that might speak for itself, but I can also go back to that. Um, uh, the Hawthorne effect, novelty and disruption effects, and experimenter effects. Um, so let me just go back to, again, some of these that we're looking at. Um, multiple treatment interference, that kind of makes sense. There's multiple uh, interventions or treatments happening at the same time. How are you measuring the impact um, of any of those? And one of the things that I should have done, I had notes in here. Um, and I can't see them because I'm not on presenter mode, but that's okay. I'm just gonna riff off the top of my head. Um, so um, yeah, you can, you can see how, uh, okay. So let's go back to that other one. Lack of explicit description of independent variables. No, I actually did have a slide for that. So I'll move forward. Um, Hawthorne effect, uh, novelty and disruption. I'm gonna give you a slide on that one. Um, so internal, this is an internal threat to validity. And this is just one of the examples. Um, this is an historical threat. So you have the definition of the threat, which is um, events during a study that can influence the results other than the experiment or the treatment itself. 
Um, so for example, um, let's say at a school, the researcher wants to study, um, uh, it's a youth mentoring program for students who, are, uh, who have risky behavior. Now, what if the school decides to, at the same time, also start a drug prevention program, but you're dealing with, mentor, men, you're doing a study on youth that have risky behavior. If those two things start at the same time, historically, they're going to they're gonna affect one another. Um, and so the original study about mentorship um, for risky behavior is going to be impacted by this now other thing that's come in at the same time, or maybe not necessarily at the very same time, but three months later, now the school starts a drug prevention program, and those things are impacting one another. Um, so how do you, how do you, how do you uh, control for that, or how do you, uh, how do you make sure that that impact, um, that that impact's not happening? You could use two groups, um, uh, and in which not all of them are receiving the experimental treatment, which is the drug prevention program. So you could have two sets of students in the, in the mentoring study, one that is gets the drug prevention in treatment and one that doesn't. And so historically, they may be both going along at the same time, um, but then you get to sort of do, do a bit of a control of one group while you're collecting the information and you still can do the study on both groups of mentoring, of the impact of mentoring. Um, the design of the study design is actually a really, um, it, it's, it takes, you know what, honestly, study design and research design is a whole course. It's a, it's a, it's really a whole graduate course. And I know, um, that those of you who are working in the sciences or the social sciences, um, will, will probably have come across you taking a whole graduate level course, um, doing study design. Um, but obviously what you put into the study design, what do they say? Garbage in, garbage out. And that's in terms of data, but it, the same applies to the design and the implementation of it. So again, it comes down to that foundation. How you lay the foundation of your research design um, will dictate uh, the outcomes, um, will dictate the data that you collect, will dictate the validity of that data um, and the way that, and will impact your, your, your thesis statement, obviously. Um, and so building your research is your research design is really important. Um, and so again, if you can get into any courses where that, that, that is being taught, I encourage you to do that. If you haven't already, I'm, I'm assuming that many of you have. Um, maturation is another threat to validity. Um, and this is when you have naturally occurring changes in the study participants themselves. Uh, so for example, over time, um, people get older. Um, people, people get older, they develop over time. This is specifically important, let's say in child development or um, yeah, in, in child development, um, or they could get uh, more tired, uh, let's say test taking. Um, if you do uh, a really long, if you have people uh, filling out a very, very long questionnaire, maturation can actually apply to this, the process of taking the questionnaire. If you've got a hundred questions on that questionnaire, uh, your students aren't going to be as energized at the end of that questionnaire as they were at the beginning of that questionnaire. And so they're going to get tired. And so their response, their responses may, may become uh, incorrect. They may be not be as engaged um, or you'll get different data back based on, based on how tired they are going through the length of that questionnaire. So sometimes questionnaire length um, can have an impact on your study. Um, Another example, and this is the one I'm using, is that they become, for example, better readers. Again, it's a developmental issue. Ad children become better readers of the time. So if your research is children's ability to read out loud and you're studying children's ability to read out loud, and it's the same group of students that you're studying, over time, they're gonna become better readers. So you have to adjust um, or you have to work out um, how you're gonna manage and integrate that information into your, into your, research, into your data collection. And the other thing is too, let's say um, you, you're running a research paper on uh, the ability of children to read out loud. And so for some kids, um, you've got an additional treatment or, um, um, or um, intervention where you're having parents also read out loud at home with the kids. So you've got two groups of students. One, and they're all development, they're all developing over the same course of time. So uh, it's the same time period. You may look at kids from the time that they're eight to the time that they're nine, or from the time that they're eight to the time that they're 10. Um, but looking at their ability to read out loud may be impacted um, if, if they have parents, they were also reading out loud with them at home. So both groups of students 
developing over time and should be developing their capacity to read out loud, but one group reading out loud with parents and increasing their capacity and the other group not, but still studying over, over time. And the way that you, that you can measure um, the distinction and the development is by how much, for example, that group that's being read to by parents at home is exceeding the group that is not. So you get a better sense of the measurement of how, how, that, develop, how that development in the reading capacity is happening. Um, okay, lack of that lack of explicit description in your variables. Um, so this is this is another. Remember we remember that gold medal it that word that I just gave you the it. Um, this is this is one way of this is another example of gold medal um, vagary in the sense that if you're not describing your your um, your variables uh, very carefully. Um, then, then the validity of what you're saying uh, doesn't doesn't hold any weight. So, for example, um, the use of specificity in the level of detail in describing the intervention or naming of variables. Um, so, you you use the example is you use a generic label such as youth services when referring to the intervention. Okay, youth services. Um, if I'm talking about that students received youth services, let's drop in the chat, see, if, let's drop in the chat um, different services that uh, youth could receive. Let's let's uh, make a list of, of some youth services. Let's see, they could get um, after, well, am I allowed to do that? After school sports. So that's just one example of a youth service. Um, counseling. So if anybody else has any other ideas um, about a youth service that they could that, that a kid could receive either at school or in their community, what are some other examples of youth services? You can drop them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Oh yeah, okay, great, yes. A feeding program, yep. Yep, they can be in a music program. Um, so environmental cleaning. Um, okay, so I think um, I just wanna make sure that, that what I'm asking for is that not what the youths can do in terms of service provision or that they're, so I maybe asked the question wrong. Um, so not necessarily what the youth can do, what they are doing, but what are the things that a youth can receive in terms of a service, mentoring, yeah, counseling, um, but you know, actually participation in a cleaning up program is, is actually a service. Um, homework assistance, yeah, yes, computer skills, training, absolutely, yeah. Those are really good examples of things that uh, you, a youth service, a service that can be provided to youth. Mentoring, okay. So if I am describing um, a study in which I'm studying a group of youth or young people, and I say that they received a, a service, um, it could be any one of those, it could be any one of those services and I don't know what that service is or what the impact is of that service on, on, the, on the students or on the youth uh, that I'm studying. Um, so the detail of your description has to be very tight. So they received um, homework assistance. And when you do that, so you wanna talk about, let's say, mm, I'm gonna, sorry. So when you're talking about the service uh, or the variable, you also want to talk about, um, Oh my goodness, uh, the duration, um, the levels, um, uh, the number of treatments. Um, over time, you want to talk about um, uh, delivery. So some of the ways. So yes, now that you've now that you've pointed out that is actually, let's say, um, therapy that that these youth are receiving a therapy session. Um, was it group? Was it individual? How long did that therapy last? How long was the session? 
And how long did the sessions go on? Did they receive one hour of therapy um, over each week? And if they did, for how many weeks did they receive the therapy? Um, levels, I, I, I can't really speak to the level of therapy necessarily, um, but again, number of treatments, how many times did they receive the therapy? And how was that therapy delivered? What mode of therapy was it? Um, and was it delivered in a group? Was it delivered to an individual? Was it delivered in a school? So, uh, you know, if you need to be really careful about and, and supply all of these details and make sure that, your, that the structure of your research is including in your research design, all of these details. Um, so the way that you control for that validity problem is obviously you choose appropriate levels of detail and when you're describing the intervention. Um, and some of the ways to do that are precisely these, the duration, the level of the intervention, the number, uh, under what circumstances was the intervention delivered, lots of ways that you can be more detailed. Um, but if you just go uh, and use a very generic or a vague term like they received a service, uh, you're performing it. <laughs> I want you all <laughs> to think about it when you're doing your writing. Um, okay, novelty effect is another external threat to validity. So novelty effect. Um, the definition, an initial newness or novelty of a new behavior or intervention that gradually dissipates over time. Um, and anyway, let's, we can divide those two things up. The novelty of the thing and then how that novelty wears off. Um, so for an example, engagement or behavior increases simply because of the, the treatment is new or different, um, but that also that newness kind of gets redu reduced over time because newness fades as we know. But again, there are two things involved there the newness of it and the novelty of it, which is all very exciting, and then how it gradually, that newness, that novelty effect wears off. Um, so uh, here's, here's one way to do it. So let's say um, you're looking at, for a group of youth who are doing math skills training. Um, they, now suddenly you give these kids a really cool app uh, on their phones to practice their, their skills training. What's gonna happen? I, I give some kids uh, a, a new app that has, whoops, that has, um, looks pretty funky, platforms really cool. Um, what's gonna happen there? In terms of a novelty effect. So I wanna know, I'm trying to give kids some math skills. Um, and then I give them this, I, I you know, I, I give them this app on their phone so that they can practice their app, their math skills. What might happen? You can drop your answers into the chat if you want. Or just unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're gonna love it. Yeah, I think so. And if they love it, what's gonna happen? What'll happen if they love that app? So the intention of the study is to increase students' um, mathematical skills. And then you give them a really fun, yep, <laughs> yes. That's them exactly, yeah, that's it. They'll get really excited about it and they'll be super into it and they're gonna do it a lot more. Yeah, and actually that's, that's actually can be another threat to validity. Uh, Maureen, you said, let's say you've got two groups of students that was a really good thing that Maureen just brought up. If you have two groups of students um, uh, or you're studying two different schools and you're looking at um, uh, improving students' math skills and at one school, you give all of the kids that app and at the other school, you don't. Or in one class, you give the kids that app and in the other grade 10 class or form, form I don't know, forms, uh, form B class, uh, you don't give the app to the students. What happens if Maureen's point's a really good one? What happens if they share the app with their peers? What happens? I'm trying to study the kids who have learning math skills without the app and the kids who are learning the math skills with the app. What happens if they start sharing? Yes, exactly, contamination. Very nice. This is, this is what happens when, you're, when your subgroups or your populations are speaking to one another and they're sharing the treatment because the treatment effect is then going to apply to both groups. Um, so that can be problematic. So that's another threat to validity. Yeah, is contamination. 
Um, and yes, here's the other thing that you have to take into account is the fact that if it if it's um, uh, if if the outcome of your research depends on that timing of how the dissipation effect, then you're going to have to talk about that dissipation effect in your in your study. I, it won't always matter, um, but but in some cases that dissipation effect will. How long did it take for that novelty to wear off? If if the actual dissipation effect is what you're studying in and of itself. Um, so there's that's why I divided that into two things: the newness of it that creates that engagement, and then the dissipation of that engagement over time. Um, so here's another way that that happens um, uh, for people taking testing. If you're doing a repeat test, you test at one point in time, you test in this point in time, and you test again, um, and you're testing for certain skills, uh, for example, or you're or you're testing for a certain thing or a provision of information. Every time the students or the your subgroup or your population sits down and takes the test here, they do it here, they do it here, um, or that they're repeating the intervention a, new, a number of times, the novelty of that intervention is gonna, um, is gonna dissipate over, over, those, over that time period. And you're gonna have to figure out a way to explain and describe and account for the dissipation of that over time in your study. There's so much to think about when you're doing study design and research, isn't there? It's so much. It's like, oh my goodness, I have to lay the foundation properly. I got to speak to everything that came to before. I got to talk about how it fits now. I got to talk about why it matters. Who does it matter to? Where's it going? I got to project this thing into the future. Then I got to build it right. And then I got to make sure it connects all together. Every sentence saying, why does this matter? So what? And then at the end, I, I got to make sure I'm citing everybody properly. Man, I, this is why academic writing is so different and so challenging from any other writing you will ever do. Um, and it's hard. It's hard. And so the, the most support you can get, uh, I, I encourage you to get it because it's, it's super tough. Um, okay. I'm going to go back here and then we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, okay. Oops. Um, so really, what, what, what's the lesson here? And I just wanted to wrap this up and just talk about, you know, um, what's the lesson? You're building a house. I know last time I used, I used that, um, that vision uh, or that, that image of the, the timekeeper, the hourglass, which I have and I'll show you. Um, but, you know, think about this in stages. In the planning, you want to do that literary review and your research. Um, in the execution and in the writing, you want to make sure your study design is sound and that your implementation is sound of that of that research uh, and your study your how you're carrying out your study. Um, in the synthesis, your data collection and analysis has to be sound and done well. And you have to consider again these threats to validity. And there can be threats to validity. You can you can you can acknowledge I had this problem and here's how it turned out. Um, pretending that everything in, in your academic work is perfect um, is is also not necessarily success. So saying, look, I anticipated one thing, but this happened. As long as you say, you know, that the an unanticipated thing happened, that's okay. Um, it's perfectly fine as long as you admit that the unanticipated thing happened and you're not fudging your data to prove that it didn't. Um, and, and, and in the communication, in the write-up of your, of your study. Um, so, you know, this is really the, the, found, the building blocks of, of how you build your academic house. And I just talked about it in terms of a paper. Um, but I'm going to go to the chat and let's see. Um, Oh, great. Okay, so somebody has listed some more uh, wonderful, some more resources there. I encourage you to share them amongst yourselves. Um, again, one of the other things that I'm not sure about, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, one of the things that I'm not sure about is uh, citation. So uh, different disciplines will have different citation um, requirements. So in psychology and in the sciences, they're not the same. They, they sometimes look different. Um, different programs, again, different disciplines will look different. Um, I know that even your citation, you could be doing um, MLA citation or Chicago citation style citation in your paper. Make sure you're clear with your instructor on what the expectations are in terms of how you're citing. Uh, and then the format for that, for that, those citations, um, either in your references at the end or as you move through your paper, ask for clarification so you get it right. Um, yeah, 
So I'm gonna go through the chat again and make sure that I can send uh, really the slides like last time. Uh, and then you, if whoever did not get the first ones, um, I, I'm, I'm sure I really can send them to you, but I will also send her the slides from this presentation as well. Um, and I think you've been all really good at, if you have resources, you've been dropping them into the chat. Um, oh, and also I said I would do this last time. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to now, I, I, won't, I won't be able to answer uh, all the questions specifically, but I may be able to direct you to a resource. So I'm gonna give you my, my address, my email address. Um, how do you address validity issues in a secondary data source? Whoops, where did that go? Or a retrospective study, especially if you have, if you only have processed data. Um, hmm, right. Uh, so if you're using somebody else, uh, an existing data set, is that the question? There's not much you can do about it if it's, if you're, if you're incorporating a secondary data set into your own. Um, but if there, if you notice that there's something going on there that doesn't make sense, you can say it. Um, because just because somebody else got published doesn't mean they got it right. And it's really important and it's okay to acknowledge that in your own paper. Um, I don't know why I'm waggling my pen at you. <laughs> but um, it's really important to be able to say, to go back at, at um, previous work that's been done and say, you know, there was a problem with this study. In fact, uh, I feel like um, um, the way that they presented their outcomes or their data uh, wasn't wasn't necessarily right, and I can see where where things went wrong. It's actually really important if you see that in a paper to bring it up, because like I said, just because some oh uh, yeah APA, um, but I uh, yeah, um, so yeah, thank you for raising that API style, and I'm sure you can find resources for how to do that citation. Yep, to quote one another from publications. Um, and it's also just, it's also okay to say that you're, you're, we talked about your academic ancestors in the past. It's okay to say they got it wrong. But again, I think I talked in my first slideshow about how you go about doing that. You could say, you know, I think it's interesting to take it further. I think maybe some of the things they didn't consider in this paper were, uh, instead of just going back and saying, um, you know, Onyango uh, was 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 wrong, uh, but that is in the first slide, the first slide presentation that I did. Yeah, this is really hard, Maureen. You're right. Academic work is <laughs> is really hard. Um, interesting that that you think that it could be shorter. Um, yeah, keep asking yourself the question. If you feel like you're rambling on, if you cannot answer, so what? At the end of every sentence, at the end of every paragraph, you may be, you may be, you may have information in there that's not necessarily, not necessarily, or uh, it's not doing anything. It's not a good brick. It's not a good brick in your wall. Now we're going to all start singing Pink Floyd. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna. If you don't have any other questions, Aurelia, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up there, and I will ask for any other questions before, and then um, I've left you my email in case. Now, uh, the papers that I did get to and did give you feedback on. Um, for those of you who submitted a chapter, I was not able to go through the entire chapter. Really, I wanted to see in the first, you know, opening two two pages or opening ten pages, were how you were framing your papers. Um, how you were laying that foundation. Because if the foundation wasn't there, I was giving you some indicators on how to get it there. Um, and so just know that if I didn't do a whole bunch of like, that's awesome, that's amazing. It was all amazing. Um, you guys are all, you are all doing very much, very important um, in work. And and I, and my hat's off to all of you for, uh, you know, that focus that you have right now on your on your uh, area of study. So if um, if it didn't feel like there was a lot of clapping, I'm clapping now. But I just was going through each of them to take the time to point out where you could be a little bit stronger. Ah, you can cite as far back um, as 1966. And, and actually, if you're if you're looking at the thread of a theory, 
that has come through different uh, iterations or progressions over time, uh, it's important to go back and cite that theoretical history um, because that theoretical history builds and compounds on itself. And it's really important, again, to show where you are standing in that academic river that, that is flowing and that has flowed maybe back all the way to the 60s. If there was a really important um, founder of the theory that you're working with or concepts that you're working um, on, and it's important if you ask why, why it's important to bring them, bring them in, it doesn't matter how long ago it happened. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, it's Gmail. Uh, SydneyColes18 at gmail.com. Yep. Oh, sorry. It's Gmail, not Gmail. <laughs> so I hope I hope today was helpful. Um, because last time, you know, uh, I, we talked about the research paper and how to structure it. And, and this one was just really the process of writing and, and making sure. It, so I hope that your some of your takeaways um, uh, are, you know, you know, this is crazy to say this, but that one of your strongest takeaways should be so what <laughs> and if and why. You got to constantly keep asking you the, yourself these questions when you're writing. So what? And if it and if you don't have an answer for yourself, uh, then you can't answer it for your reader. All right. And I, I really wish everybody continued success. You're doing really great work. Um, stay focused, go back, get those details sorted out. Um, you know, oh, yeah, I just wanted to show you this from last time. This is my little timekeeper that I use uh, when I don't want to do something. Um, and so what I do is I set it and it's a 15 minute timer. Um, and I'll say, okay, I just got to sit down here in front of this blank piece of paper and for 15 minutes, I'm going to write. And then when those 15 minutes are over, yeah, um, I, I turn it over again. If I can get two turns done when I don't want to do something, I know I'm engaged and then and I'm good to go. Okay. Um, I'm going to sign off. If nobody else has any other questions, let me know. My email's there. Uh, Aurelia has all of the papers that I, I gave you feedback on, um, and, and either you'll have access to that in your uh, on that platform or she'll send, send it to you. So I hope everybody uh, much success, and I hope maybe I'll see some of you again. And it was a real pleasure to read your work. I learned a lot. My gosh, I learned so much. So thank you for that opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney, for making time again. Yeah, and, this was fun. <laughs> so we are going to, to send over the papers. I think I saw you're now done with them. Uh, we are going to send them over now to everyone so that you can okay. see the feedback and you can begin to work on it. I think the, the, the key word I have gotten today is so what, and be very <laughs> conscious. Everything you do, Everything you put on that paper, you really have to do it very consciously. So thank you so much. We will also put out, uh, pull out the questions on chat and use them to discuss further in the group. Otherwise, yeah. from us, thank you so much, Sydney. Have You're a so lovely welcome. Day. All right. All of you, let's go back to the journal club and, and also discuss further some of the things that have come up. And I wish you the very best. Yeah, same. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.